All right, well, welcome to the Knoxville History Project, our monthly Zooms. Seems a little longer now between uh, between the talks, but uh, we enjoy you uh, having us join us. So uh, our mission is simple. We research, preserve, and promote the history and culture of Knoxville, Tennessee. A good time doing it. I um, wanted to plug, put a plug in. I've uh, done this before, but I'll uh, continue to do it. Um, encourage you to uh, check out our website, uh, find something to read, something to watch, something to buy, maybe. Um, but also, um, particularly, I want to mention um, our podcasts page um, on the Engage section. Uh, if you've not listened to it, a um, few a couple of months ago now, we put out um, kind of a first uh, episode in Knoxville Chronicles uh, with Jack reading his own story, uh, The Printer's Devil, about the story of uh, Adolf Ox. It's about 18 minutes long. If you've not um, listened to that, I encourage you to do that. You can do that on the website. And uh, we're going to be doing more of these and hopefully uh, establish uh, with some funding um, a series of them uh, next year. But uh, we are going to be putting out another one, kind of ha uh, Halloween related, uh, another story that Jack wrote uh, for the Knoxville Mercury about two or three, well, four or five years ago now, I guess. Um, so watch out for that. It's actually going to be a, a shorter one, about eight minutes long. And uh, someone else is going to read it uh, as a change. So uh, we will be putting that out either in the newsletter next Tuesday or one day between now and Halloween. So um, look at that. Also want to put a plug in for our partner, Laura Still and Knoxville Walking Tours. Uh, she's very busy uh, doing uh, kind of Halloween. Well, not really Halloween necessarily, but a, a kind of shadow side ghost tours. Shadow side is, uh, again, taking inspiration from one of Jack's uh, stories, uh, books from a few years ago. Uh, but she does, um, you know, tours every day of the week, practically, uh, if you'd like to go on one. So uh, go to knoxwellwalkingtours.com. Uh, she was one of our guests a couple of months ago when she talked about the new book that she uh, collaborated with us, uh, right in the book of it, uh, with one chapter by Jack, uh, Fair Shake, Story of uh, Women's Rights in Knoxville. And if you've not uh, had a chance to pick up a copy of the Haunted History of Knoxville, um, again, a lot of these stories um, based on uh, Jack's research and uh, storytelling in years past. So. Uh, great book with, a, with these not just ghost stories these are really Knoxville history stories with a ghostly event uh, also uh, you can pick those up at uh, the, our online shop and also if you go to the Knoxville walking tours you can pick up uh, those books there if you, if you prefer that um, if you've not supported us lately or never at all we encourage you we are a non-profit and uh, thrive because of community donations and support so thank you and uh while we're thanking people, continue wanted to thank uh, council members Lynn Fugate and Charles Thomas from City Council for continuing to support this series in 2021. Uh, uh, to, uh, to our funds. Also, um, tonight, uh, sponsoring our History Happy Hour with Old Grey Cemetery with Jack. I want to thank Lillian and John Mashborn, um, good friends of the Knoxville History Project. So thanks, Lillian and John. And I'm going to hand it back to Jack and a kickoff, kind of a virtual walk around Old Grey Cemetery. Okay, Jack? Yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is something I'm surprised we haven't thought about doing earlier, just kind of a, 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 a literally a, a, a kind of a walking tour on online of Old Grey. It's always been a, an, an interesting thing to, to do. I've been giving tours of Old Grey for probably 30 years uh, or close to it. But uh, it's a fascinating place. I, uh, I have to say I've been, uh, I've, I've had misgivings about, about making a big deal of Old Grey in the month of October. In fact, if you're in the TV news business, you know that I've always declined to give tours of Old Grey in October because I, I don't like the association with spooky things, with trying to spook up Knoxville. I, I, I've, I've never ever been asked to give a tour of Old Grey for TV in any other month but October. But I always said I'd be happy to in the spring or the summer or dead of winter or whatever. But uh, October is uh, people can get, get the wrong idea about Old Grey is a spooky place. And we've seen the results of that in recent years when one of the finest statues in Old Grey was, was broken uh, uh, as part of some, somebody's idea of a Halloween ritual. Uh, at, at Old Grey, uh, and uh, apparently someone tried to climb on a statue, and there's a lot of candle drippings around. They're obviously trying to be spooky, doing something 
but uh, but but broke uh, uh, irreparably broke the statue. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, I'm, I'm I trust you all. So we're we're doing it for for our, our good friends at the Knoxville History Project and, and and Old Gray themselves last Sunday had their annual for the first time ever had their annual fundraiser in October and we had a really good crowd there for that uh, Sunday afternoon and I I gave a uh, gave one very long three hour tour. I promise not to keep you uh, that long tonight. Um, but uh, Old Gray is is uh, is pretty fascinating. It's a it's one of the most interesting uh, pieces of property in uh, in the in the greater Knoxville area, I think. Uh, 14 acres of stories basically is what it is. And I know just a few of them, but I'm gonna be happy to, to share them tonight. Uh, Old Gray was founded in 1850 as a private project, just as a way to get uh, uh, have a nice place to bury people outside of the center of town. This was part of an international movement uh, called the Garden Cemetery Movement that started in, in Paris and uh, caught on in a lot of the bigger cities uh, and by the 1830s or so uh, in, in, in America before it came to Knoxville in 1850. Uh, and they, it was established, uh, they had the first burial there by 1851. And by the end of that decade, there were hundreds and hundreds of people buried at Old Gray. Uh, it's, uh, it's, the name is, uh, is not, has nothing to do with the Civil War. Uh, it's, uh, it was named uh, for very deliberately for Thomas Gray, the English poet, who wrote, uh, as you, I'm sure you remember, uh, Elegy written in a country churchyard, which even if you have not read the poem, you would recognize seven or eight different lines in it. It's a really one of the most famous poems in, in English literature. Uh, it has uh, the, the line of far from the matting crowds, ignoble strife. Uh, it has the line, uh, the paths of glory lead but to the grave. Um, it's uh, it's a, a great piece of work, uh, but they, the people who, established Old Gray in Knoxville in 1850, admired that poem, especially a woman named uh, Sarah Reese, who was uh, the wife of the president of East Tennessee University at that time, uh, and she's buried here. Um, but uh, it, was, uh, um, it's, it, was, it was set up in, in 1850 and became kind of a, a, you know, an interesting place for burials. It was a, uh, it was the, the idea of the Garden Cemetery movement though was, to get graveyards away from the idea of crowded churchyards and family plots, which is what most uh, a lot of graveyards were before the mid 19th century, uh, to make them beautiful and make them uh, gardens, basically, to, to, that you would walk around and want to visit, even if you're not mourning a loved one. Um, so uh, this was uh, it fulfilled a role for burying lots of people, and we were getting more and more people into Knoxville in the 1850s as the railroads arrived. Uh, but also as a as a it fulfilled a uh, a lack that Knoxville had for a long time, and that was the lack of a public park. Um, but it was a it was it was a much appreciated uh, answer to that to that need, uh, and people actually would come here on a Sunday afternoon and and go have a picnic on in Old, in old Gray, and and there, there are stories of people falling in love and getting married at, at Old Gray in the in the Victorian era. Uh, but it was, of course, the, this came about at the, at the time of the, high, the height of, of, uh, of elaborate and extravagant sometimes uh, memorial uh, statues. Um, lots of interesting things about the statues in here. But we're, we, uh, we, we had the uh, entrance shot earlier. The entrance is still very narrow. I always recommend that people park uh, across the street or around the corner on Tyson Street. Because these gate, the, this gate was was made for horses and carriages, and and it's it's if you anybody that's try to drive in here and try to drive out knows that it's hard to see what's coming on Broadway uh, when you when you do that. So it's really a, a pre automobile design uh, that that Old Gray has. Um, the uh, but it's we uh, some of the uh, the you walk into the to the graveyard. Some of the first uh, graves you see. Are those of, of really uh, famous and very powerful people in their day, uh, and uh, the first one that we come across when you walk into Old Gray on on the left is the plot of Horace Maynard and his family. Uh, Horace Maynard uh, is the guy that Maynardville is named for, and if you might think that he's from Union County, you, you would be mistaken. He was from Massachusetts. He became he was much honored in Union County because he's the lawyer that helped Union County secede from Knox County um, in, uh, in the early 1850s, not long after 
Old Gray was established. But he later became much more famous for other things. A fascinating guy, kind of an intellectual uh, who had uh, who had studied uh, at at Amherst uh, in uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, he he came here at, in rather early in his life uh, and uh, was uh, became a, a newspaper columnist occasionally, but but was mainly an attorney and later got involved in politics. He was a a member of the Whig Party in the 1850s uh, and became our first uh, one of our very first Republicans in in uh, East Tennessee. If that guy doesn't look like a Republican. Uh, well, he's he is the guy that kind of founded the Republican Party in Knoxville, you could say, and was the first of the unbroken chain of Republican congressmen we've had ever since his term in office during the Civil War. And his term in office was remarkable during the Civil War because he he was elected as a Whig. He was in office when his home state uh, allied itself with the Confederacy. When Tennessee was a Confederate state, Horace Maynard kept his seat in U.S. Congress in Washington. He kept going to work there, working with Abraham Lincoln. He was a good friend of Lincoln's. Lincoln discussed putting him on his cabinet at a couple, on a couple of occasions because uh, he really wanted to, to, to connect with the Southern uh, Republicans. And, uh, and this, that never happened. But, but Horace Maynard was, uh, was a dependable uh, Republican vote, sometimes allied himself with the radical Republicans after the, after the uh, Civil War. Uh, later on was a, a, an ambassador under Grant, was an ambassador to, to the Ottoman Empire uh, and was lived in Turkey for several years. And there were all sorts of uh, rumors that the Democratic Party was spreading about what he was really up to in Turkey. But, um, but he, anyway, he was a fascinating guy. He actually worked with Heinrich Schliemann, the uh, German um, archaeologist who was searching for Troy. Um, and the story is that Schliemann gave Maynard a chunk of Troy that Maynard must have brought back uh, you know, some kind of artifact. And I would love to know what happened to that. If you have anything peculiar in your basement, please uh, please let us know if it might have belonged to Horace Maynard. He lived on Main Street right downtown. And uh, his house was much honored after he died in 1882. It was still there for years. They say it was just still there full of his furniture with, but with no one living there, uh, not far from where the Baptist church is now. Um, but, but very interesting guy, one of the very few people. I think Knoxville was the only city in America that was, that was, that was represented by both in, in both Confederate Congress and U.S. Congress, thanks to Maynard's uh, extraordinary choice. His desk, by the way, is at the, at the East Tennessee History Center and the museum there. Um, but um, anyway, uh, but, but fascinating guy. I could go on about him. He ended his career as a U.S. postmaster. Was, uh, that was his last job. Um, but here's a, an interesting a bench, which is not always unoccupied <laughs> at uh, in Old Gray, but uh, th this there to memorialize the Maynard family. Uh, he had an interesting several sons. Uh, uh, this is one of them, uh, who, uh, and this is not a broken monument. This was installed this way to uh, to represent a life that was not fully lived. That was kind of a Victorian uh, artistic conceit in those days to to do. To represent a, a, an unlived life uh, with uh, with a broken monument, uh, his son uh, died in the Grand Turk in the Turk Islands, and uh, was of a of a disease. He was down there as a federal official uh, as a young man. Died, I think, in his twenties uh, when he was down there. But uh, that's just an interesting thing. This is one thing that you'll see as you walk into Old Gray Cemetery. This this uh, Maynard monument. Uh, next one, please. All right, this is another Republican congressman, Henry Gibson. Uh, this is one of the tallest monuments in the graveyard, and it's one you come to right on the right when you walk into Old Gray. Uh, Henry Gibson was uh, had uh, lots of roles, as you see on his stone. He was proud of all the things. That the, uh, he was a public servant, really. He was a lawyer, but he was a public servant uh, throughout his life, uh, uh, but was, uh, was a congressman, a Republican congressman for, uh, what, uh, uh, 10 years. And uh, during this time, he was able to use his office to help uh, help get federal funding for the Union Monument, which stands uh, just down the street at National Cemetery. He was a big supporter of National Cemetery. Um, but Henry Gibson was, uh, interestingly, was the most famous uh, survivor of the New Market train wreck in 1904. Uh, that was the most horrific uh, transportation disaster in East Tennessee history, uh, and uh, we don't know 
for sure if this made a change in his life. He was getting toward retirement age anyway at the time, uh, but he was uh, uh, what uh, he was, I guess, uh, in his 60s at the time, but survived this wreck at which many people were killed and, and many others were mangled in, as these, these two trains ran into each other in 1904. Uh, but at that time, whether that had anything to do with it or not, he got out of public life. He didn't run for Congress again. And he spent the rest of his life writing epic poetry, uh, writing very long uh, form poetry. And he also began dressing eccentrically. He uh, was known to wear kimonos and fezes in his later years. And that's something I would love to see other, other retired Republican congressmen do, uh, start develop an interesting fashion sense. Uh, but uh, what, was, uh, what was interesting, as you notice it from his dates, he, he lived to the age of 101. Um, but uh, his wife is memorialized here too. She was also a poet. And they even mentioned one of her poems on this on this grave. She, had, she wrote a poem uh, with kind of an otherworldly theme called the Moon Maiden. Um, but uh, they, uh, they they seem to have had a good a good and very long marriage. Um, but next one, please. All right, this is not too far from um, from uh, the Gibson uh, grave. Uh, this is the grave of Belle Coffin, wife of Thomas Lanier Williams. And uh, if you know um, uh, literature very well, you know that a uh, certain playwright uh, was named Thomas Lanier Williams III, is, is better known as Tennessee Williams. This is Tennessee Williams' grandmother, uh, Belle Coffin, uh, and she died at a very young, at very young age, as you see, just uh, age 31, probably of tuberculosis. She died at a uh, at a sanitarium in Texas. They often thought that going to a drier climate would help people with uh, serious respiratory ailments. And, uh, and sometimes it did, but uh, with tuberculosis, it was more difficult. Um, but uh, anyway, he, uh, uh, her, her husband, uh, Thomas Lanier Williams II, uh, was a guy that uh, never quite achieved what he meant to achieve. He ran for governor several times. He never uh, got, uh, got where he wanted to be, but, uh, but and tried to raise his, uh, his kids right, but was wasn't he wasn't uh, very good at it. He kind of farmed out his kids to other other people. Uh, but uh, one of his kids was the guy on the right, uh, Cornelius Coffin Williams, uh, who was buried right nearby. This is Tennessee Williams' father, um, and he died uh, there in, in 1957. Uh, I'm not. I need to get this down so I can see my. Yeah, not, yeah, 1957. And Tennessee Williams himself came to uh, the uh, burial service here in, in 57 and uh, got some grief from the public for uh, someone had noticed him. One thing, he was wearing a white suit at his father's funeral. They did have a troubled relationship, although that, they seem to have gotten along better in, in later years. And, and Cornelius Coffin Williams was not, was not comfortable with his son's sexuality, certainly, but uh, but later in his final years was saying he was proud of his son, that he was happy that it, with the success that he had seen on Broadway and in movies by this time. Of course, uh, by this time, uh, Streetcar and Desire was out and lots of, he, he was really a well-known uh, writer. Um, but but uh, Quinny, uh, Tennessee Williams was here and was wearing a white suit and, he, and he, some people gave him grief for signing autographs at his father's uh, funeral. And uh, he snapped back and said, well, if it's impolite to uh, sign autographs at your father's funeral, surely it's impolite for people to ask you to sign autographs at your father's funeral. Um, but he wrote a piece about this, which is called The Man in the Overstuffed Chair, uh, which is a very interesting uh, uh, piece to read about kind of his, his mixed feelings. And they were mixed. They had uh, positive and negative feelings about his father. He really never, uh, never, uh, achieved what P Williams family uh, people expected of, of, a, of a son. They're, this is a family of, of, of major lawyers and judges and politicians. Uh, and C.C. Uh, Williams was a shoe salesman in St. Louis most of his life. He moved back to Knoxville in his, after he left his wife uh, and his final, spent his final years in, in Knoxville. Uh, next one, please. Jack, we had a quick question about yeah. um, one of the previous ones. I think it's on this one. What, do you know why it says Joseph Templeton Brownlee at the bottom here of Gibson's? 
I guess it says pioneer of textile industry in no, Tennessee. No, I don't. I well, do actually, not it says know. his I... wife was Helen Gibson Brown. Well, yeah. So that's a bit of a mystery, isn't it? Yeah, I'll I'll I'll, I'll figure that out. I'll I'll, uh, I'll make a point. Well, thanks for the question, Donna. But we'll have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, this is uh, kind of more in the center of the the entrance area of the uh, of the of the cemetery. Uh, the grave of uh, of Thomas Humes. Uh, Thomas Humes was one of the most fascinating guys in in Nazi history, just for the range of his career. He was he began his career as a journalist. He was an editor of a paper when he was still in his twenties. Uh, he he uh, went to Presbyterian Seminary, uh, only to find out that he really wasn't a Presbyterian, and he became an Episcopalian uh, and and became a, a an Episcopal priest. Was the rector at St. John's. For many years, uh, lived right next to uh, the the uh, uh, West Dallas Cathedral uh, downtown, and uh, later on, uh, as you see, was president of the University of Tennessee. Uh, he was president. He became president of East Tennessee University, but it, be, it became the University of Tennessee during his presidency. And this was uh, partly he was a he, he had been a hardcore unionist uh, during the war, uh, and this uh, probably helped UT get. Its Moral Act funding, uh, which was what uh, what the, the congressional funding that had passed during the Civil War, that was not available to any Southern universities until after the war. And UT, I think, was the first Southern university to get this federal funding, which had already enhanced uh, Northern universities uh, during and 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 the years soon after the war. Um, lots of stories about him. He wrote. Uh, he, he he experienced the Civil War. Uh, firsthand, he was he was not uh, not of an age to be a, a soldier, but he uh, was, wrote a, a, probably the best uh, firsthand account of the war, uh, the, the best contemporary account of the war in Knoxville that I know of. It's called the Loyal Mountaineers of Tennessee. And they're very vivid, several visit, vivid scenes described in there. But he was the, a very influential president of UT for this whole period. Was uh, uh, was was kind of. Uh, nudged out, I think, when uh, he was he was a hardcore liberal arts guy and they were saying we really need to have more vocational education here. And he uh, he left UT uh, as an old man and you would think to retire. Uh, but in uh, what at the age of, uh, of uh, 70 or so, he was in his 70s when he became the very first full time librarian in Knoxville history. Uh, when he when they first opened the Lawson V Library, uh, uh, Thomas Humes was the librarian, and that's uh, that's an interesting fate for a former uh, university president. But I think that he he found it uh, an honorable and and, uh, and I think he was very pleased. He, he he liked the work. But that was when the library was on Gay Street near um, in, in the building still there known now to, as the Herbori Building. But uh, but a, a a fascinating fellow to have been a journalist and fiscal priest an academic and then a librarian in his, in his life. And, and arguably he was our first historian. He wrote a, uh, as a very young man, wrote uh, a uh, historical monograph about this, the oldest history of Knoxville I know of that was, that was uh, read as a, as a speech in the 18, uh, 18, early 1840s when they were Knoxville, a few people were celebrating Knoxville's 50th anniversary. And, um, so that that's one of the earliest uh, narratives of Knoxville. Before that, no one had thought the place was important enough to uh, to record. But um, interesting guy. Next one, please. All right, this is the Albers Fountain, and uh, this uh, is is kind of a puzzle in some ways. Even if you know a bit of the story about it, about five years ago, um, th this fountain had been there, uh, put up in the 1890s as a memorial to. Ella Albers, a woman who died young, and it's interesting that almost all the statues in Old Gray are statues of women, and all those statues are statues statues of women are, are, are meant meant to memorialize women who died young, and usually before the age of forty five or so, uh, mothers and daughters especially. Uh, so these were people who were much mourned when they died. Uh, Ella Albers' husband was a, a very a, prominent industrialist. He was, his name was Andrew Jackson Albers. He was a union veteran of the Civil War, was, uh, was a pharmaceutical executive and, and founded what became known as Albers Drugs. 
Um, and uh, this was uh, one of the longest lasting uh, businesses in, in Knoxville history. It, it uh, felt it uh, was bought up only 20 years ago or so. But his wife died uh, way too young and uh, he memorialized her with, his, with a fountain here that was here for about uh, 60 years. And then it disappeared. And uh, if you haven't been into Old Gray in, in five years or so, this might be surprising to see uh, because this was the fountain that was known to most of us only in photographs uh, over the years. But a big fundraising effort uh, uh, and, and uh, the surprising connection with the original uh, uh, foundry that made this metal statue uh, and still had the, the, the mold for it uh, resulted in, in what you see today, a perfect uh, duplication of this old fountain. What happened to the fountain though is kind of a puzzle because for many years, and I said this for many years because it's in, uh, it's described this way in Heart of the Valley, the book that the, the original statue was melted down for scrap during World War II, a World War II scrap drive. Um, but I was pretty surprised to find uh, a picture of it in 1949 with an accompanying article in the Nostal Journal. 1949, they weren't, this is long after they'd finished uh, melting stuff down for scrap for the war drive. The two lower statues in that picture are missing, uh, but the rest of the statue is there and is described as being in remarkably good condition. But uh, we don't we really don't know what happened to it. Probably in the 1950s, the statue disappeared, and uh, and and but now it's now it's back, and maybe that's that's the important thing. But uh, and a very lovely and interesting statue. It's kind of the centerpiece of of Old Gray in, in some ways. All right, next one, please. All right, this is uh, right behind it in the same little uh, circular area, uh, the Mead statue, the Mead family. Uh, you, you'll recognize the name of uh, Mead because Mead's quarry at Imes Nature Center is the quarry that they used. And obviously they were very proud of what you can do with marble with this really intricate uh, uh, design uh, that they have here. I may, some people may recognize something Celtic in, in that. But uh, the, the Mead statue was, uh, it, it's interesting how people sometimes use their family memorials uh, to advertise their businesses. And this was, stands there as a, as a quiet representation of, of, the, of the family business. And I, I used to say that, you know, it was almost like, a, like a, uh, an, an ad for, for Mead's marble. But then I found an actual ads for Mead's marble in, 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 uh, in, in magazines. And they use a picture of this of this very stone from you know like 120 years ago did, but the Mead family, Frank Mead and his uh, and his other uh, members of the family are are buried at this at this spot. But next one, please. All right, this is the one that always uh, startles people. Uh, this is the only uh, only monument in in Old Gray that's not made of of marble or granite. It's made of metal, uh, and it's uh, it's hollow, and you can you can walk up to it and knock on it, and you can tell that it's made of some kind of a, a zinc alloy, I think. But um, yeah, the uh, 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 Lazarus Clark Shepherd. It's interesting that a guy named Lazarus, uh, who of course was the guy that Jesus raised from the dead, uh, it was our undertaker, um, and uh, 120, 130 years ago and was a, a well-known and well-respected guy. Uh, by the way, he was also a, a, a philanthropist and was uh, very interested in taking care of the poor. He was a, one of the founders of the St. John's Orphanage uh, and, uh, and was also one of the first five founders of the Knox County Humane Society, uh, which is now, I guess, called the Tennessee Valley Humane Society, one of the oldest humane societies uh, in in the South um, in 1885, uh, but L.C. Shepard, along with Peter Kern and some others, uh, founded this society that was set up to get people to stop beating their horses, more or less, and stop abusing their animals, uh, and have had you know, remarkable success in, in many ways. Uh, Ernie, our our, co our colleague er Ernie Freeberg's book, uh, which came out about a year ago. Uh, is about the the uh, uh, guy named Henry Berg uh, in New York who founded the Humane Society, and it's a it's a great story. If you haven't read that book yet, it's a fascinating story. His story is mainly about the New York area, 
uh, and his uh, kind of unexpected success uh, at every turn. Uh, but was, there are some very dramatic scenes in there, and I'm not surprised that, that uh, movie people are interested in that in that book. Uh, but Shepard was uh, was was here was well you know well respected around town. He was from Connecticut originally though, uh, but an interesting fellow. I'd like to know more about. Uh, next one, please. All right, this is uh, uh, probably Union is probably outnumber Confederates here, but General William Caswell was uh, was a a Confederate. Uh, I, I think he was he was kind of like a. a a guy, they call him a general, but he, I think he was in charge of kind of the home guard, sort of a defensive uh, group here in, 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 in and around Knoxville. I don't think he ever saw combat, interestingly, because he died young. He was actually murdered at his farm, which I think was on the east side of, of town, a, a, a murder that was never solved uh, during the war. Um, he was just out, I think, riding his horse or something and was found, uh, was found dead. But his son, uh, who's also William Caswell, is the guy that uh, that he was a uh, interesting guy that was involved in everything from furniture to grapefruit plantations in Florida in the uh, eight what eighteen nineties and later. Uh, but William Caswell is the guy that founded Caswell Park uh, and kind of donated land for Caswell Park. And it was uh, he loved baseball, and I think he was happy to see that baseball was played there in the early days. Uh, William Caswell Jr., uh, General Caswell's son, was one of the first known baseball players in Knoxville, in fact. So uh, an, an interesting family. Uh, next one, please. All right, this is uh, the most famous unionist of all and, and, and probably the most famous single person buried at Old Gray Cemetery, Parson Brownlow. Parson William Ganaway Brownlow uh, was uh, a Methodist parson in his youth, a uh, circuit riding preacher. Uh, later on was a journalist of sorts, although he was sort of a, more of a, uh, I think, comparable to a, to a, a shock jock or, or, a, or a pundit uh, during his, uh, his career as a, as a newspaper man. Uh, he, people would, would, uh, would subscribe to his paper just to read the outrageous stuff that he would say about his enemies, and he had many, many enemies. He began with the Presbyterians, who he thought were completely uh, 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 woefully misguided, uh, he he uh, didn't like the Catholics. He thought were, were controlled by the popes. He didn't like the Irish immigrants. He didn't like uh, he didn't like black people. Uh, he he uh, uh, a lot of his stuff is really if you want to find something really racist in the 1850s, uh, look at Brownlow's wig. Uh, but more than anything else, he hated the uh, Confederate aristocracy, the Southern aristocracy, and he hated secession when it happened. He became a hardcore Unionist. He became a pro-slave unionist, uh, and this was not that uncommon in this part of the country. He had actually uh, was not only a, 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 you know, a, I think he owned one or two slaves, but uh, a, a, on occasion he was not a major uh, slaveholder. But but he was uh, 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 but he he had his paper originally in Elizabethan and then in Jonesboro, I believe, but opened his paper in Knoxville in 1849 and called it the Knoxville Whig. And this, uh, during the Civil War, was a hardcore Union, pro-Union paper. Um, and uh, he considered the whole Confederacy to be a, 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 a terribly, uh, a, a big mistake and, and a, a treasonous uh, plot against the United States. Uh, he stayed in Knoxville during Confederate occupation uh, just to be ornery, I think. And uh, a lot of Unionists left, but he did not. He and his wife stayed in their wooden house in downtown Knoxville, right by the road, a uh, very vulnerable looking place. And he would raise his American US flag every day. Every morning he would go out and raise his flag in defiance of the troops that were parading by. Uh, and also kept running his anti-Confederate paper in Knoxville. And the uh, Confederate authorities were not quite sure what to do with him. They knew that he was, uh, that he was extremely popular, but they didn't want to make a martyr of him. By, uh, by hanging him or something. Uh, they jailed him, they threatened him with hanging and they jailed him. Uh, and uh, they said, uh, we'll let you go if you swear loyalty to the Confederacy. And he refused uh, repeatedly. And, uh, and, uh, and they, finally, they finally banished him from the Confederacy, sent him up north. And, uh, and there he went on a speaking tour and became more popular than ever, uh, began talking to large groups. And during that time, he had seems to have gone had a, either a change of heart or a change of plan, 
uh, he became an abolitionist and a fierce, ab uh, a fierce abolitionist. He did nothing by half. He had been a hardcore pro slaver before the war. He'd been an abolitionist. He became an abolitionist about 1863. And uh, he came back to Tennessee as soon as it was in Union hands and, uh, and was elected governor of the state. This guy who had never held public office in his life at age 60, suddenly he's governor of Tennessee at this critical time in, in the history of the state and the country. And as governor of Tennessee, uh, he, he, he made friends with black people and who, who were so fond of him, some of them thought that he was black himself. Uh, he, he gave the right, of, right to vote to black men in Tennessee in 1867. Uh, he uh, and, it, and he, he passed the uh, 13th Amendment uh, with the state legislature with no problem. The 14th Amendment was more of a problem. It was more it was controversial even in the North. Um, but uh, but thanks to Brownlow and to some extraordinarily unorthodox tactics, including kidnapping legislators and forcing bringing them to to in into the state house to force a quorum. He passed the 14th Amendment in Tennessee. Tennessee was the third state in America to pass this controversial pro-civil rights amendment, thanks to Parson Brownlow. But Parson Brownlow, uh, and thanks to Parson Brownlow, black men in Tennessee could vote uh, before they could vote in most northern states. Uh, I think only five northern states allowed black men to vote uh, before Tennessee. Uh, but Tennessee uh, had black men could vote and therefore black men could hold office too. That, and that's why in Tennessee, I think the first three cities in America and maybe in the world to have biracial city councils were uh, Chattanooga, uh, Nashville, and Knoxville. Um, so this was uh, um, uh, just a, a remarkable thing that he did just in four years in office uh, through uh, some extremely unethical means, but he accomplished the passage of these two amendments, which nobody argues with today, uh, the 13th to 14th amendments are just essential parts of the U.S. Constitution. Um, but uh, but they were very controversial in Brownlow's time and in a time when pe some people, even people who had been who had been abolitionists before the war, were saying, "Wait a second, we didn't mean to say they could vote." Uh, Brownlow was saying, "Yes, they can," and uh, that was uh, that he he did amazing things uh, in his time. The, the Ku Klux Klan, of course, tried to kill him. Uh, and actually did kill at least one of his agents, but uh, but he was uh, he was a uh, he was a, a, an amazing guy that deserves a deserves a full book length treatment. I, I think historians are afraid of of getting into Brownlow and all his complications. But anyway, but he's buried there. He had been a U.S. senator before he died, uh, and uh, was buried here with uh, one of the largest uh, uh, monuments in the graveyard. Uh, he had uh, he had fans uh, for many years. Uh, Republican presidents from from uh, uh, from uh, Harrison to uh, McKinley to uh, Teddy Roosevelt and to Taft would go visit his wife at, at they were at Mowers of Brownlow and would visit his widow who who kept living in their house for almost fifty years after he died. But she lived on they lived on East Cumberland in an area that was later urban and old away. But a fascinating fellow um, uh, for good and bad reasons. Uh, next one, please. All right, right across, and this shows you something about the diversity of uh, the uh, political diversity, at least, of Old Gray Cemetery. Uh, right across the lane, uh, within spitting distance, is this grave of uh, Colonel Henry Ashby, is uh, is uh, a, a Confederate uh, colonel uh, who was uh, who, who died uh, rather young, as you see, uh, because he was shot to death in downtown Knoxville by Mayor uh, Eldad Cicero Camp. I'm not uh, he was not mayor. He was uh, he was uh, a businessman, but uh, he was uh, he was the guy that lived at uh, Grace at, uh, at uh, Greystone. But uh, yeah, they had an uh, argument about the war uh, in 1868, three years after the war, and uh, Camp shot him and and got got off on a self defense plea. Uh, but nice one, please. But right not too far from there is Grace Abbott. Uh, this is one of the very few uh, black people who were buried at Old Grace Cemetery. And uh, the only one I know of that actually references her, her, uh, her original state of slavery. It says, born a slave, died a child of the king. Uh, that's, uh, she was a, 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 a servant uh, of the Rail family, the Rail family, R-A-Y-L. 
uh, were supporters of education and Knoxville were, they were interesting folks, but they were, their, their plot is, is not, not far from this, this area. Uh, next one, please. And right by there, in fact, I, the other day when I was giving the tour, I talked about both Grace Abbott and Evan Alexander at the same place. Evan Alexander is a fascinating guy. He's a, if you picture a guy who was a rather small in stature and, uh, and, and, and poor of health as even as a young man, um, and he becomes a, a classics professor. And what, what do you really expect of a guy like that? Uh, this is, uh, uh, you don't really expect him to make uh, make waves around the world, uh, but Eben Alexander actually did. And it was because he was a such a, a, a champ of the class, classics professor uh, that uh, that made him uh, made made him uh, put him in a situation that he he did make history. Uh, he was a UT professor for a while. I think he went to uh, one of the Ivy Yale or Princeton, uh, but, but but taught at UT for some time. Uh, then, uh, when UT began emphasizing after Humes was was pushed out, uh, UT began emphasizing vocational stuff. He was frustrated at UT, at UT so he went to Chapel Hill in North Carolina and uh, taught there. But he came back to, due to his health and and was living in Knoxville before he died. But in the meantime, uh, it was during the time his time at Chapel Hill that he had this reputation as a as a master of the Greek language. And Grover Cleveland thought this guy would be a great ambassador to Greece. So he chose Ebenezer Alexander to be ambassador to Greece. And Alexander moved to, uh, to Athens and uh, lived there for several years. And it was during this time, in the 1890s, uh, of course, that, that one of the, that, that uh, a, a major reference, a major homage to classics happened in Athens in a way that changed uh, world history. Uh, it was in 1896 that uh, a Frenchman and a few others got together and, and with a few others, including Ebenezer Alexander, got together and started talking about, uh, about reviving the Olympic Games. Uh, Ebenezer Alexander was there uh, at the first Olympic Games. He was the first known financial supporter of the Olympic Games and was also the reason that, um, that the United States was involved in the first Olympic Games, had a team there because Alexander actually was able to use his connections with Ivy League schools who had good athletic programs. UT at, at that time, hard to believe, didn't really have much of an athletic program, but uh, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton did. And Alexander knew these people and he got them to bring send their best uh, young men to compete in uh, in the first Olympics in 1896, uh, so this was he was he can be considered a a co-founder of the modern Olympic movement, um, but uh, but a, a very interesting guy. He came back here and was living in Knoxville uh, when he died uh, at at what's now the Prior Brown Garage, the old Prior Brown Livery Stable. After he'd taken a tour of his uh, hometown uh, on a on a on a horse cart and uh, just had a heart attack and died. Uh, at age, uh, as you see, age 59. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, interesting guy whose name we should we should know. Uh, next one, please. Hey, Jack, I'd like to ask Jack that he, um, he, was a, he was one of the early explorers and writers of the Smoky Mountains. Uh, that, that's right, that's right. And for, for a guy, a small guy with, with terrible health, uh, he was, uh, he loved to, to take long, long, long walks, and he, he liked to walk through the Smokies when you really had to had to know people or trespass to, to get there, even. And he had to camp out at least one night to, to spend a, spend any time in the Smokies. So, so he uh, really liked to he liked the outdoors and liked to do it, things outside, and liked to like to hike. Even sometimes walk from here to a Chapel Hill when he was teaching there. But uh, a very interesting fellow. All right, Perez Dickinson. I, I love to uh, stop people and see if uh, see if they see something peculiar about this uh, or something. Uh, and this is one of the re one of the things. The first time I ever came to Old Gray, the first one of the first things I noticed that that maybe there's something I don't know about my hometown. Uh, this was, you know, literally 30 years ago. A uh, the day I was laid off from World Communications, I went in with a friend of mine who'd been trying to not even from Knoxville who been trying to show me uh, around uh, uh, Old Gray and I had no interest at the time. And I walked in, I said, wait a second, this, here's a grave for Perez Dickinson, born in Amherst, Massachusetts. 
what kind of coincidence is that? Uh, Dickinson Amherst, uh, he must be kin to the Belle of Amherst, Emily Dickinson, the poet. And sure enough, he was. He was uh, her first cousin once removed, and they knew each other. Uh, he actually went back to Amherst during the Civil War when she was there. And so they, they certainly knew each other. But he's the guy that established, uh, he, he brought a, a, a woman home from Massachusetts to marry, and they married were married for about a year until she died. Um, and uh, he was a widower for the rest of his life, uh, but, but established what we now know as Island Home. That was his island home. Uh, his main home was on Main Street, near actually near where Horace Maynard lived. Uh, but all, his island home was over in South Knoxville, and the, the house is still there. It's used. It's on the campus of Tennessee School for the Deaf today. But uh, but uh, an interesting. He was a merchant mainly in his life, and made his living as a merchant. But he loved. He was fascinated with uh, with uh, experimental farming, and that was what his island, his island home area, was known for a rather, rather large farm where he was always trying uh, new things. And you know, the largest ever watermelon, or the largest ever bull, you know, or things that he grew at uh, at island home. But uh, but another interesting fellow. Uh, next one, please. All right, this is nearby there, and I can't remember who it's who it memorializes, but it's a uh, it's a woodman of the world uh, stone. This is the most elaborate one I've ever seen. You see these in several graveyards around uh, all over the country, but uh, there's if you have a Victorian era graveyard, you have at least one. But the woodman of the world was a and, and still actually still exists, but it was an insurance fraternity. You would you would join the fraternity and pay uh, dues, and you might have social events, but you would also be slowly uh, buying burial insurance, and one of the ways that they advertised their 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 uh, insurance uh, uh, fraternity was to give you a Woodman of the World statue, and they were they were uh, they were very distinctive, obviously and unmistakable for anything else. Uh, but this is uh, this is one one of uh, one of several in Knoxville, but probably the most elaborate one I've seen at, there at Old Gray. Uh, next one, please. Uh, this is the McGee plot, and uh, we have uh, the, the most famous McGee at the time was Charles McClung McGee, major industrialist, railroad man, involved in lots of uh, lots of industries, uh, and uh, uh, and but he had a lot of kids uh, who were all buried here. Um, but this is again a novelist, one of the, the tallest novelists in the graveyard. But one of his kids was Lawson uh, Lawson McGee, who uh, uh, he he. Uh, when he established a library, she died in childbirth up in New York in 1883. Uh, he was already thinking about establishing a library and he decided that, that the library should be a memorial to his daughter who died far too young. Uh, and, uh, and that this, if you look for her grave though here, it's not here. She is said to be buried here. Uh, but the story I've heard is that uh, he could not bear to see the grave of his daughter. And I can imagine uh, that no father probably would would uh, would have an easy time of that. So basically, he said the library is going to be her memorial, and it, it, her memorial will not be in the graveyard. It, the library itself is the, her memorial, and uh, it's uh, uh, so that even to this day, uh, Lost Me Library is named for named for her. Uh, next one, please. All right, and this is just down the way from there. This is William Rule, uh, one of the most admirable people, I think, in Knoxville history, but maybe it's because he was a journalist most of his life. Um, uh, but he was a, just a, a fair-minded guy. He was, a, he, was a, uh, he, he was a Union captain during the Civil War, uh, but was the uh, mentor, the first mentor of Adolph Fox, who founded the modern New York Times, uh, but was, was uh, in charge of the Knoxville Journal for uh, gosh, uh, or and his predecessors for about sixty years. He was a he was an editor for that long. Um, had worked with Brownlow as a young man, um, but was uh, believe it or not was still the editor, the working daily working editor of the Knoxville Journal at age eighty nine. Uh, when uh, in nineteen twenty eight, when he uh, came down with appendicitis and uh, and and died of appendicitis at that age. Uh, after having written a, a, a story about the uh, the new uh, the Republican nominee for the presidency, Herbert Hoover, but amazing to think that this guy, who had been a Civil War soldier, lived you know long enough to see the Tennessee Theater, for example, and, uh, and 
and to see the modern age, see airplanes and and radio and and all the stuff of of the of the modern era. Uh, but uh, but fascinating guy. He wrote a book about Knoxville. Uh, edited a book called uh, the Standard History of Knoxville. But he's also mayor uh, a couple times. Uh, much much appreciated in his lifetime. Uh, was one of the people in uh, behind. Uh, the uh, efforts to build the Union Monument in the National Cemetery uh, next door. Um, uh, next one, please. All right, this uh, uh, TH Smiley uh, is is a grave I just noticed uh, a couple of years ago for the first time, but, but from Springfield, Vermont. He was a well-known photographer of the Civil War era. Some early uh, 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 Civil War era pictures are taken by him. He died not too long after that, obviously, but. Uh, but just an interesting, uh, interesting guy to, guy to run across on the main central lane there. Uh, next one, please. All right, this is uh, just down the hill from there, Peter Staub, who was uh, from Switzerland. He uh, was, he considered himself Swiss his whole life. He was a, uh, served as a consul uh, from Switzerland to America and also from America to Switzerland. He moved to Switzerland, uh, uh, back to Switzerland after he'd been here for a while. But he came here first to establish a kind of a utopian community for refugees from Switzerland uh, that was going to be called Grootly. Uh, and this is over in uh, kind of the southern Cumberlands, not too far from where Bonnaroo is held every year. Uh, Grootly Lager is still there, the, the site of this utopian Swiss refuge that Staub created. But uh, as is often the case with these utopian refugees from, from Wartburg to uh, to rugby, uh, to to Grootly. Uh, they're not exactly what people expect when they when they when they came over. Yeah, as someone says in, in, in Mayor Clark says in Grundy County. Um, but it's uh, it's uh, uh, but they they came there and they were angry at Staub, uh, and and it sounds like they almost kind of ran him out of town because it was it was uh, it was it was really harsh an harsh environment to live in, especially in the winter time. And a lot of these Swiss uh, came, went into the cities. Some of them went back to Switzerland, but uh, some uh, Staub, uh, uh, Staub actually moved to Knoxville after the Civil War and uh, founded uh, and, and built uh, one of the first things he did, uh, astonishingly, and I don't know where, how he got the wherewithal to do it. He built an opera house uh, and on Gay, Gay Street, across the street from where the Bijou Theater is today was Staub's Opera House, which was later known as the Lyric Theater that some, some people on our, on our uh, on our meeting tonight may remember, uh, but it was there for about 80 years until it was torn down in the in the mid 50s. Um, but uh, Staub's Opera House was was a major a major thing for uh, for East Tennessee, the main auditorium for the whole region. If you wanted to see anybody from you know Frederick Douglass, the lecturer, to uh, uh, to uh, uh, Lily Langtry. Uh, you know, singers and dancers and actors, the Barrymores, the Cohans, all these people. W.C. Fields was there, uh, I think, every year for a long time. Um, but it was, uh, Staub's Opera House was a big deal. And uh, Nas was so appreciative that we elected him mayor uh, twice. Uh, so he was a uh, one of a couple of, uh, one of several, actually, foreign-born mayors of Nas Um Next one, please. Uh, and here's another another guy, another foreign-born mayor, Peter Kern. Peter Kern arrived here as a refugee from the German revolutions of, of, of 1848 uh, as a young man in America. Just uh, his mother was sure that they were going to either uh, uh, draft him or kill him uh, in Germany, so she sent him to America. And this must be a heartbreaking thing to, to have to send your kid away forever. Uh, but he he thrived in America. He uh, it took him a few years to get his bearings, but he was uh, moved to several different places, lived in the north and the south for a while. Eventually settled in Knoxville. Uh, due to a, a accident of the Civil War, he had been a Confederate soldier during the Civil War because a lot of his he'd been living in Georgia at the time it broke out, and a lot of his fellow farmers joined the, the Confederacy, the Confederate Army, and he did too. He was wounded uh, early in the war was sent back to recuperate and very dutifully was on his way back to the front in, uh, in Virginia when uh, he was passing through Knoxville and at the time of the Union occupation. Uh, so he was stuck here. He didn't know anybody here. He met a couple of Germans lit here. Uh, one of them suggested uh, that uh, 
uh, that that they uh, should sell uh, uh, that, that they should sell something to these troop trains who were coming through. And he said, "I've got a a dollar for a barrel of, of flour. If you have a dollar for a barrel of molasses, let's make hoe cakes and let's sell them to these troop trains that are coming through Knoxville every day." And uh, they they did that and and uh, sold sold them probably to the soldiers just you know, through the windows of the of the of the of the cars and um, and uh, uh, did made some money and and Peter Kern decided he liked baking he he started Kern's Bakery and uh, built made a quite a, a, a quite an operation out of it Kern's Bakery as we know it today is the place where Tupelo Honey is and uh, the Oliver Hotel. But it, in Kern's day, it was a place that had a, 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 a ice cream saloon on the second floor. It had uh, a soda fountain. He, he, had, he sold toys. He sold fireworks. Anything fun, uh, Peter Kern was was uh, was 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 happy to sell. Uh, but uh, interesting guy, and he was so he, he also brought a lot of German traditions uh, here with us with him, including uh, the Santa Claus and um, and Christmas trees. He, he, the first image of Santa Claus. I've ever seen in a Knoxville newspaper was a Peter Kern ad, uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the the he and his wife uh, kind of showed Knoxville how to how to decorate Christmas trees, which were a brand new idea to most people in Tennessee. Um, but a uh, very interesting fellow was uh, was our last immigrant mayor elected in 1890, um, but uh, much beloved here. And uh, uh, the later Kern's building on Chapman Highway was was built after his death, but it was still very proudly known as Kern's Bakery for quite a long time. And still, in fact, Kern's, the Kern's brand still exists. Uh, I think it's connected to a bakery in, uh, in Virginia now. But um, all right, next one, please. All right, this is Peter Kern's uh, place. It's, uh, it's Eleanor Audigier. And uh, she was a, a, a patron or matron, if you want to say, uh, of the arts in Knoxville in the 1890s and very early 1900s, uh, was sort of the organizer of what became known as the Nicholas and Art League, uh, which, uh, of course, was connected to Catherine Wiley and some of our, and Lloyd Branson, some of our best known artists. Uh, was, uh, she lived on Kingston Pike uh, in the place that's now, uh, coincidentally, the, uh, the, the uh, where the Doolin House was built, which was that later an art gallery, um, but uh, but anyway, she was uh, and and she can sometimes seem like in, in pictures and in some of her letters, she can seem like the uh, what that the uh, the society lady in a Marx Brothers movie. She was very proper and she did not like uh, when she moved to Europe with her husband uh, to Italy uh, later on and and did not like uh, Cubism and and uh, was kind of warned her friends at home about uh, what Picasso and his friends were up to. Um, but um, but she was was uh, she was an older woman at that time, and very few people over fifty were much impressed with Cubism. Anyway, so we got to give her a break, I think. But she loved beautiful things. She collected beautiful things, bought a lot of artwork in 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 Europe, uh, and uh, and and sent it home when she died. She willed it to uh, to be to come to Knoxville and be on display. And it was her art collection was on display at UT at at uh, Hoskins Library for about 40 years until it was broken into and pillaged uh, on a couple of occasions by burglars in the, uh, in the, eight, in the 1970s. Um, but uh, anyway, she, she died in Rome in 1931 and uh, was, uh, this is one piece of marble in the, in the cemetery that is not Tennessee marble. This came, actually came from the Carrera qu uh, quarry and, that Michelangelo favored in, uh, in Italy. Uh, but uh, obviously a, a lovely uh, depiction of the Madonna. Um, but an interesting, very interesting lady who uh, who kind of raised the bar for culture in Knoxville the time that she was here. Uh, next one, please. All right, this is uh, this is one that's that stymied a few uh, a few uh, historians over the years. Uh, this has actually been recorded by some people as uh, as a, a Greek guy who must have been known as en Enoe de uh, Ketai. But actually, that means uh, that, that word, how we pronounce it, is uh, is Greek for basically in memory of. And the guy's name is the second line down. His name is Nicholas Kolokithis. Uh, he was uh, he was uh, murdered uh, in in downtown Knoxville in, in 1905. Uh, was uh, was 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 buried here. And who who had the wherewithal to give him a Greek 
carved grave. This must have been a, an expensive grave to, to install at this time. At a time when there were only a few Greek families living in Knoxville, this is before the Reguses and a lot of the others were here. This is really early, um, but uh, it's uh, an interesting. There are two Greek Greek carved graves in Old Gray, and this is uh, this is the one that's easiest to to see. But uh, but interesting. I was I was uh, happy to help with uh, when a, a Greek Orthodox priest wanted to give. Uh, some, some. He wasn't sure whether the, this guy got services from a Greek priest when he when he died here because there weren't any around. Uh, so we actually went out there, uh, and uh, he was in his black robes, and he actually did uh, some um, some some funeral rites for Nicholas uh, Kolokithis. Um, all right, next one, please. All right, this is the grave of Lizzie Crozier French. Uh, and uh, you can kind of tell some parts of her story by looking at this, uh, at this uh, grave, uh, that she was married uh, and her, her husband was named William Baxter French. And he died very young, uh, right before he turned 30. Uh, so this left her alone as a single mother in her, in her 20s. Uh, but she, uh, she did have some resources through her family and uh, did uh, uh, did remarkable things. She really devoted the rest of her life to to uh, raising the uh, the, the uh, raising the intellectual standards of Knoxville. For one thing, uh, she actually would would have. She's known as a suffragist today, but she would have uh, host uh, speaking events by all sorts of people, Unitarians and spiritualists, and and uh, people who are concerned about air pollution and things like that in in her house in downtown Knoxville. But she was really especially interested in helping women, and she was for a time the principal of the Women's Institute, which was the uh, school that we had downtown uh, for uh, at a time when UT did not allow women to be students um, in the 1880s and early 90s. Uh, she was the, the main principal of that of that school. Uh, but later on, she was really best known for for pushing for suffrage, and as an old woman, that was her her main. Uh, her main goal was to see suffrage happen. And as you see, she died in 1926. She lived well into the uh, era that women could vote and hold office. She actually even ran for city council of Knoxville uh, after, um, after the suffrage passed. Uh, did very well, but not quite well enough to, uh, to, uh, to be elected. She made, uh, got enough votes that would have earned her the, the seat in, in some races, but apparently a lot of people voted in this in this election and she uh, lost fairly narrowly. Uh, but uh, uh, fascinatingly, we have a whole story about her in our in our uh, uh, book uh, that Laura still wrote for us called A Fair Shake. Uh, and A Fair Shake is actually a, a phrase of, of Lizzie Crozier French's that she used that all she want, all she wants, all women want is a fair shake in America. But uh, 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 interesting lady. Um, uh, next one, please. Hey Jack, before we do, we've got a question about who the names are at the top. Do you, above William Baxter, do you know? William Baxter, son of Isabella Lawson White. I think they're, uh, he, he was kin to the, to the White family. Um, I'm not, I don't know his genealogy, but, um, but um, William Baxter, yeah. I'm not sure why they have his name twice, sort of. Uh, maybe that's his father mentioned. I'm not sure. Um, okay, yeah, know, uh, William Baxter French, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, William Baxter French, son of Isabel Lawson White, and William Baxter French, I guess, his father. And these the dates are, of, of him are for, for uh, Lizzie's husband himself. But, uh, yeah. All right. Here's a, an obscure grave that I did not know about until fairly recently. And uh, this is Leonidas Hoke. He's a, I knew about him. He's very well known. He's another one of those Republican congressmen uh, who we've kept elected every two years since the Civil War, um, regardless of whether they're uh, very progressive uh, uh, civil rights Republicans or conservationist Republicans of the era of Teddy Roosevelt or conservative Republicans of, our, of recent decades. But Leonidas Hoke was kind of right in the middle there. He was kind of a machine Republican. He was a, a, a boss uh, guy, and, and he had, had a lot of enemies. His worst enemies were probably 
fellow Republicans who were of a different faction. He and William Rule did not get along. Um, but uh, Leonidas Hope was a guy that, that liked to control things, uh, but he was still very popular. And uh, interestingly, he died after after uh, uh, after taking a, a, a swig of uh, of arsenic in a downtown pharmacy. Uh, and in fact, it was about not very far at all from Old Gray Cemetery. It was over at near Fifth Avenue and Central, uh, Depew's Pharmacy. And uh, why he drank arsenic there uh, while he was waiting for the pharmacist to get something for him. Uh, is a mystery and there of course at the time there were suspicions of murder or uh or suicide or something it may have just been a, a crazy weird accident why why a pharmacist would have a, a glass of arsenic on the counter uh as if waiting for him is uh is a, is a puzzle in itself uh but he died died the next day his uh his son john hoke uh took over for him but just served a, a, a term or two in congress but he, he's, he's interestingly not in a very prominent place. This is way over on the, on the high hill uh, on the south side of the, of the cemetery. And that's why I never noticed it before. It's, uh, it's just kind of off by itself, unlike all the other Republicans who are kind of clustered near the front. Uh, next one, please. All right, and just down the hill from there is uh, Catherine Wiley, of course, our greatest impressionist painter uh, who had a, a, a tragic and kind of mysterious life, was a very, very talented uh, painter, well known as a young woman, known in, in her own time, uh, won lots of awards for, for painting. They considered, uh, began uh, studying up north with impressionist uh, painters, and I think study abroad some too, but she uh, loved impressionism, and she's considered today Tennessee's greatest impressionist. Um, but uh, but she had some kind of a problem. Something happened in uh, in 1926. Her family had her committed to a mental institution and in, up in Pennsylvania, and she spent the rest of her life there. And we don't know very much about at all about this. It has been described as schizophrenia, but uh, I've I haven't found any 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 uh, description of her acting out or anything like that in the papers. It's uh, she was uh, she had a lot of friends here. She was uh, I mean she. She and Lloyd Branson were close. She may have been very depressed because several members of her family had recently died and Lloyd Branson himself had also died the year before uh, she was committed. But, but a, a, an interesting woman that we uh, would, would like to find out more about. Um, her, her paintings are all over the place. They're at KMA, they're at, uh, at McClung Collection. You can see her paintings in lots of different places. They're also in the collections of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, next one. All right, this is one of the most uh, startling graves that you see in the graveyard. Uh, there are several graves that have pictures of trains, uh, but this is oh, but this is not the New Market train wreck, Paul. This is uh, this is an 1875 uh, train wreck. This is uh, a, a guy uh, named Holloway who was a a, 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 a engineer for a train that came upon a trestle that wasn't quite ready to cross at back uh, in, in, at that time. And it's, it's remarkable that they actually depict, the only, this is the only stone I've seen that actually depict, well, actually there's at least one more uh, that depicts actually the, the, um, the, uh, the mode of death uh, on, on, on a stone. Um, but this was what, what happened uh, to his, uh, his ill-fated ill train uh, in 1875. Um, the only one, other one I can think of was the grave of Pete Chris, the race car driver in Asbury Cemetery that has his, his car going off the rails uh, at, at the Indianapolis 500 track in, uh, in 1931, where that was, that he, he was killed. But uh, anyway, interesting kind of a startling grave. Uh, next one, please. All right, this is Eliza Boone, uh, wife of Edwin Hodgson, born in Manchester, England. Uh, the uh, operative word on that uh, grave is, is Hodgson. Uh, this is the, uh, it's a grave just by itself. There's no one else named uh, Hodgson around her. Uh, born in Manchester, England, that's another clue. But this is the mother of Francis Hodgson, Hodgson Burnett, uh, the, uh, the writer of The Secret Garden and Little Lord Fauntleroy and lots and lots of other popular books. Uh, uh, Paul uh, Brown and I, Paul Brown is writing a piece about uh, that has to do with her. And we did a, 
I checked and found out that there are 65 motion pictures known to have been made based on Frances Haas Burnett's books, um, at most of them in Hollywood. But anyway, she's buried here by herself. Uh, her, she left, uh, uh, she was already widowed, as you see. Uh, Edwin Hodgson had died back in Manchester. Uh, she left a, a large family of teenage kids, basically, who were just lived by themselves for some years and lived in a place that they call Vagabondia in downtown Knoxville and just lived as they wanted to. And fortunately, they weren't uh, into anything really dangerous, but they were, uh, they were all creative. It seems like almost all of them were uh, musicians or artists or, in Francis's case, a writer. And she was already, uh, by the time her mother died, she had been selling, as a teenager, had been selling stories to national women's magazines. So, uh, so but this was her, her mother's grave. And the, the story is that her, uh, her brother, who's the only one that didn't uh, succeed at something in his life, uh, was a, an alcoholic and died uh, in the streets in downtown Knoxville around 1904 and uh, didn't have any money to be buried anywhere but the you know pauper's graveyard or something but they did bury him uh, the, the story goes in in his in his mother's grave so he may he's, he's apparently there as well uh, next one please all right this is the McClung family plot probably the most impressive architecturally it's almost like a city of the dead all the graves you see in this picture are uh, are, are McClung family uh, graves very uh, prosperous merchant family. Uh, they dated back to the uh, Charles McClung, the forebearer who came down here from Pennsylvania as uh, what son-in-law of, of James White. But a lot of interesting McClungs are buried here. Uh, but uh, uh, the, of course, McClung Tower, McClung uh, Museum, uh, McClung uh, Collection are all named, named for three different McClungs who are all either buried here or close skin to people who are buried here. Uh, but we have one particular to point out next, and that's uh, 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 Lee McClung. Uh, Lee McClung, uh, and you, as you see on the gravestone, he was, uh, he was a graduate of Yale University, class of 1892, uh, treasurer of Yale uh, later on, and treasurer of the United States in 1909 to 1912. If you're a numismatist, if you collect old currency, you might know that his his, uh, his signature appears on all US current currency uh, during those three years uh, during uh, Taft's administration. Uh, but Lee McClung also was famous for something else that's not mentioned on here. He was really the, one of the America's first big football heroes. He was the captain of the Yale University football team back when Yale University was, was considered the best football team in America. Was, back then football was mainly a, an Ivy League a pursuit. UT didn't have a have a, a, a team when Lee McClung began playing for Yale in the late 1880s and began uh, being becoming known for his, his amazing feats on the field. He scored more than a thousand points uh, in his in his college career uh, as as a as a ball carrier. Uh, but uh, just a, 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 a an impressive guy. And Lee McClung became famous in Knoxville. At, at a time when the sports pages were almost entirely about horse racing and baseball. Uh, suddenly there was this new sport called football that our, our own Lee McClung that we all knew well uh, was succeeding uh, in outrageous ways almost at, at Yale. And it got people interested. One of several things that happened at the same time that got people interested in football. Uh, I think and, and Lee McClung actually came back to Knoxville and uh, helped uh, coach some of the early football teams here. Not at UT, just some of the like city teams city league teams that were here at the time. Uh, but that's uh, an interesting fellow. He was a Baha'i uh, follower and was, uh, was interested in that and died, died uh, rather young in, in London, uh, England in 1914. Uh, next one. All right, this is just down the hill. This is the saddest uh, st uh, uh, statue in, in Knoxville, I think, the statue of Lillian Gaines, who died at the age of seven uh, of uh, scarlet fever, I think, and her father, who was then uh, uh, a major state official, I think he was comptroller for the state of Tennessee. Uh, I think they were living in Nashville at the time she died, but had her uh, had her memorialized with this with this statue. And it's it's interesting. There, um, almost every time every time we come by, there are different toys in her lap, or coins, or flowers. Uh, but the the uh, statue she's holding, I, I don't know if you can tell from here, but she's holding some wilting flowers herself that carved in stone. 
but a, a beautiful, beautiful statue. Uh, next one, please. All right, this is around the corner from there, uh, the Mabry uh, stone. This is an, an obelisk, but it's a very short obelisk. And it's it might be surprising to people that these are rather famous Knoxvillians buried there, but with not a very impressive stone until you think about it. Uh, and it, it, you see uh, Joseph Mabry Sr. and jo Joseph Mabry uh, uh, Jr. Uh, are both buried there. They both have the same death dates, October 19th, 1882. Uh, they both died in the Maybe O'Connor gunfight in, uh, in that year, uh, which resulted in, in, uh, in three deaths. The guy that shot them both also was killed by their gunfire. So all three combatants were, uh, were, were killed uh, at, at, at once almost. So a uh, really unusual gunfight. They got some un, unwelcome uh, publicity, including from Mark Twain, who included an account of it in his uh, his book, Life on Mississippi, is nonfiction uh, book. But uh, uh, anyway, this is these uh, both those guys are there, and we were mentioning this one next. It's on the other side of the graveyard. But Thomas O'Connor uh, has the same death date. See, October nineteenth, eighteen eighty-two. Uh, he's the guy that shot the the Mabrys, and he's buried in the same graveyard. Uh, it was actually uh, Thomas Humes, that we mentioned earlier, uh, an old man by this time. Uh, Episcopal priest uh, conducted part of the burial ceremonies for both uh, the O'Connor and the Mabrys. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, they're, they're not the only people who shot each other uh, who, were, who were all buried in the same graveyard, but uh, fairly, uh, fairly diverse in that regard. Uh, next one, please. Uh, Esperon Dieu. Um, this is a member of the uh, French Swiss family, Esperon Dieu. I just like the, the name and the, the father of these people is Frederick Esperon Dieu, who is a, 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 a French speaking Swiss uh, refugee who came here and uh, started a vineyard in uh, Northeastern Knoxville that, that apparently was doing pretty well in, in the 1850s. Uh, he, was, he was growing uh, grapes for wine. He became a, a professor of, uh, of uh, Romance languages at UT, uh, but a very well-respected guy, but then later went back to Europe to help with the Franco-Prussian War in, in the 1870s. Some of these people, these immigrants, remained uh, loyal to their, to their people, and he was always a, a, a partisan of, of what the French were, were involved with. But uh, anyway, uh, next one, please. All right, this is the tallest uh, uh, marker in the uh, in Old Gray, the Tyson, uh, the, uh, at the Tyson plot. Uh, Brigadier General uh, Lawrence Davis Tyson uh, is buried there. He was a, a, a well-known soldier. He was uh, involved in the, uh, the Western Wars with the Apaches. Um, and early on in, in his career, he was later at uh, in the Spanish American War was uh, was a uh, uh, I think uh, was promoted to colonel at that time was involved in administration of Puerto Rico after the war. Uh, this is uh, below him is his wife Betty, and to the right is his son McGee Tyson. Um, uh, McGee Tyson, as you see, died young and and at the age of thirty one. He was a flyer uh, in, in uh, World War I and was uh, involved in some anti-U-boat activity over the uh, English Channel when his plane went down. And he was uh, one of uh, two people who were killed in that plane crash um, and uh, was brought back here to be buried. His uh, mother uh, thought we need to remember him in some way that he, that he would appreciate. And he loved flying so much, she, uh, she talked to, to Lawrence and said, let's give the city a park and uh, a afterwards uh, uh, say that the city, when it develops an, air an airport, is that it surely will soon, and it did, uh, the airport should always be named for our son, McGee Tyson. And that was uh, the deal that they made. That's the deal the city accepted. So the city accepted Tyson Park as a, as a much needed uh, public park and uh, and uh, agreed to, to name its airport McGee Tyson, no matter where it was. Of course, the first one was on Sutherland Avenue over near where West High is now. Uh, but when it, it, it was called McGee Tyson there, and then when it moved to Blount County in 1937, they kept the name McGee Tyson. And, and I think and if it's ever called something else, we have to give Tyson Park back to the uh, Tyson family's descendants. 
but one of their uh, one of their descendants, by the way, is Drew Gilpin Faust, uh, the the uh, first female president of Harvard University, uh, and also a, a historian of the Civil War as well. Uh, but uh, but it, very uh, high achieving family, obviously. Uh, next one, please. All right, here's a here's one you might have spotted through the uh, tree in that last picture. This is Virginia Rosalie Cox, who was uh, a uh, uh, an interesting lady. She lived on Kingston Pike. She was a good friend of the Audigiers we mentioned earlier, but she was a novelist. And in 1898, wrote a novel that got some uh, a, a little bit of national attention uh, called The Embassy Ball. And it's a it's a remarkably well written novel. I have to say, I've only seen one copy in my life. It's McClung Collection, but it's a uh, it's she was a, a good writer and and kind of a tongue in cheek uh, uh, kind of 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 of, uh, of of humor uh, that she that I would I might even compare to Oscar Wilde, who was a, kind of the same of the same era. But uh, but uh, interestingly, th this is the one I was talking about that was broken uh, during during some Halloween hijinks, uh, just not more than ten years ago, and uh, that that arm or the lower part of her arm uh, her hand is gone now but uh, but anyway it's a lovely still a lovely statue uh, next one please yeah we have about five left i think okay yeah great all right these are just a couple of the the, the statues that people notice uh, atkin and blanton in both cases these were were wives who died who died young and uh, their husbands wanted to memorialize them uh, so this is, like I say, there, there are lots of statues in Old Gray, and almost all of them are statues of women, with only one exception. Uh, next one, please. And this is the exception. This is uh, the horn statue. We're not sure which horn this is meant to be. There were two horns who were brothers. Uh, who uh, One, uh, this is a, uh, uh, an, obviously a Confederate soldier, kind of a, a diminutive statue. It's probably not more than four feet tall or four and a half feet tall or so. Uh, but one of the horns was a liquor uh, wholesaler who had a place on um, on Market Square where uh, on the, the uh, I'm trying to remember the uh, restaurant on the northwest corner is today. Uh, but that was, he was, he might have been the one, but they were, they were not remarkable as Confederate soldiers during the war, but they were very interested. They're uh, uh, loyal members of their uh, Confederate uh, 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 veterans organizations. But you see the statue, you can see the CS on the, uh, for Confederate States on the, uh, on the belt buckle there. Um, the, uh, the head has has come off and been reattached over the years, and I, I think the, the hat is a little battered because of that. But uh, anyway, so right over there near near the others. Uh, next one, please. All right, this is Mary Fleming Meek. I threw this in just because uh, she uh, is an interesting lady. Who every time we go to a UT balls game, we sing the alma mater. Uh, this is the lady that wrote the alma mater even though she was not an alumnus of UT because when she was college age, UT did not accept women as students. Kind of a, a bit of an irony there, but she's the lady that coined the phrase on a hallowed hill in Tennessee, like a beacon shining bright. Uh, the stately walls of old UT that rise glorious to the sight. Um, but uh, her, the reason she was so loyal to UT and uh, was that she, her father was a longtime trustee of the university and was, uh, was very proud of what the accomplishments they they'd had there, but uh, anyway, she deserves remembering occasionally too. Uh, next one, please. All right, Joseph. This is not Joseph Jacques. It's Joseph Jaques. Jaques is actually an old English name, uh, centuries old. Uh, but but Joseph Jaques is our only English-born mayor. He was mayor of Knoxville uh, twice. Uh, but this is kind of on a, you can't tell, it's kind of on a little bit of a low knoll on the on the northern part of, of Old Gray and in, in, in the middle of a circle. They're kind of a pretty, uh, a pretty plot. <clears throat> All right, next one, please. All right, Lloyd Branson is nearby there. Uh, Lloyd Branson, uh, who was uh, mentioned a close uh, associate of Catherine Wiley's. Uh, this, this stone is a little bit puzzling because uh, it, as you see, it's, it says the Tennessee artist whose genius created the picture Sycamore Shoals and by it immortalized the turning point that meant lasting victory in the American Revolution is uh, AD 1780. It's more about the battle than it is about 
Lloyd Branson, and that's really not considered one of his great paintings. It's uh, it's uh, a, a big painstaking uh, scene of of of, of you know, not everybody could do it, but but uh, the paintings that won awards in his life are paintings like the you know, the Hauling of Marble or the Toilers, as it's called. Uh, he did some really wonderful work, and sometimes kind of got on the verge of impressionism. Um, but uh, but lived in uh, lived and also lived. Uh, Kind of out of his studio at, at, at times. He he didn't really have a home until the very end of his life, and, and he lived on West Now Burwell uh, or Branson. I'm sorry, Branson Street on off of Broadway, in a house that uh, I'm glad has been has been saved and is is is, is occupied now. But uh, but Lloyd Branson. My my theory about this this stone is that. Uh, Branson, when he died, probably didn't have a lot of money, uh, and his, he didn't have any family, uh, uh, at least no descendants, to buy a, a gravestone for him. So it's likely that a patriotic group put this up and just you know, just described their favorite their favorite of as many as many paintings. But uh, but a, a very interesting fellow that, and also today he's, he's best known. He was actually mentioned in the New York Times a few days ago. I don't know if anybody noticed that. Lloyd Branson was because he was the first uh, mentor and teacher of Buford Delaney, uh, the African American uh, artist who's gotten a lot more attention in recent years. Uh, Buford Delaney was kind of his uh, his apprentice for several years in his studio on Gay Street. Um, but uh, Lloyd Branson is is often mentioned when people talk about Buford Delaney's kind of unlikely uh, uh, rise to uh, to uh, recognition as a, as an artist. Um, but um, but literally, New York Times last weekend, I think it was, there was a story about about Buford Delaney and, and uh, concentrating on, on his portrait era, which is the 30s and 40s. But later on, he was an ab abstract expressionist and considered the you know the greatest African American ab abstract expressionist in America. Uh, as he's well known in Paris, was married. Um, but uh, anyway, Lloyd Branson was 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 right there at an important time in Buford Delaney's uh, life. Uh, next one, please. All right, here's a, uh, I mentioned, we mentioned uh, uh, Henry Ashby earlier, who'd been shot to death in downtown Knoxville. This is the guy that did it, uh, E.C. Camp, Eldad Cicero Camp, who lived at, uh, built and lived at Greystone on uh, Broadway, where W.A.T.E. is today. Uh, but he's from Ohio, he was a Union soldier, uh, was a uh, major, I think, in the Union Army. Um, but was, uh, you know, later was an uh, industrialist involved in lots of businesses uh, in his life, uh, but was also uh, a, a guy that founded the Camp Home for Friendless Women, uh, which was in, uh, in the area, of an area known as the Bottom down there. It was a kind of a refuge for women who didn't have other options uh, and might be uh, tempted by prostitution and the other, other, other crime. That, organized crime that was available in that in that uh, in that neighborhood that was known as uh, Cripple Creek back then. But uh, anyway, um, interesting and kind of complicated guy in some ways, and a lot of uh, personal issues. But uh, next one, please. All right, here's a uh, Gustavus Canaba, and here's he's a name that I would love for more people to know. Uh, he was he, this guy was born in Leipzig in uh, in Germany and came over for the same reason that Peter Kern and many hundreds of other Knox civilians did. They were refugees from these horrific uh, uh, suppressions of these these failed revolutions in 1848. And Gustavus Canaba first settled in in Wartburg or Wartburg as he pronounced it uh, before he came to Knoxville and founded the first. Uh, uh, the first symphony group in Knoxville history. It was called the Knoxville Philharmonic, and uh, but was uh, an important guy. Was also considered can be considered the godfather of the UT Proud of the South Lane Marching Band because he started uh, the first uh, bands at UT in the post Civil War era. But he was kind of just in Knoxville unexpectedly. Didn't really expect to take the roles he did. He was also a composer. Composed uh, Andrew Johnson's Funeral March. Um, and uh, and lots of other things, and actually he was proud of that piece. And they played it at his own funeral at St. John's in 1906. But other members of his family are are buried there as well. Uh, next one, please. All right, this is uh, I think this is the last one, right, Paul? This is the northwest corner of Old Gray Cemetery, 
And most of these graves are graves, they're much closer together, they're single graves, not family plots, much closer together than graves in much the rest of Old Gray. And as, as you wade into it and see, you see these are all Irish people. Uh, they're Irish immigrants who came over uh, during the potato famine. That was another thing, another reason for refugees at the same time as the the refugees from the you know the German and Swiss problems that the the Irish were coming here for another reason that they were starving to death, and they settled in Knoxville and uh, and 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 some of them uh, and obviously a lot of them died, but but Irish town was not far from Old Gray. You see fewer Irish here after the establishment of uh, of uh, Calvary Cemetery, which was the Catholic cemetery on the east side. There are a lot of Irish there as well. But this is that first wave, the 1850s and 60s, uh, after the potato famine of, of Irish who settled here and uh, for whatever reason died in, in, uh, in Knoxville, a city they probably never heard of before they got here. But, uh, and one more, yeah, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, the Irish liked crosses. And uh, we included this one because uh, local people did not use crosses very much before the Irish arrived. And they were considered graven images by the early Protestants, but the Irish were Catholics and they loved uh, cro the crucifixes and crosses. And uh, you see them a lot in, in Irish graveyards. And this is one of the oldest uh, crosses I know of in, in, uh, in, in Knoxville. All right, any, uh, any questions out there? Um, this, oh, okay, this, there's some Cowan uh, statues. Uh, the Cowan family, they were uh, interesting. They were kin to Perez Dickinson. Um, and I think these are not too far from, from his plot, but um, yeah. All right, and thanks to Lily and John Mashburn um, but, uh, for sponsoring this one. This, is, uh, this has been fun. Um, and uh, if there are any questions or comments, uh, uh, now's the time to, to, to ask or, or, or express them. <laughs>